Nation, Guru Nation, Guru Nation, Guru Nation. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, share. This is a very special interview right now. We are at SOS Conference at the University of Arizona, the first annual SOS Conference. We got Mitchell Hilby here. He's Batman. You didn't bring the mask? I have the mask. You got the mask? Yeah. You got to wear it at some point. I will. Okay, we're going to get it, like, put it in the back, like, with the editing, we'll get you wearing the mask. Sounds you don't good. mess up Sounds your hair, good. though. We can do it later. Exactly. I got to speak today. Clinical Research Justice League. Yes. Can you explain? Let's start with that first. Do you have a crazy career, CRA, you have site experience, consulting experience. You're very active online, especially on LinkedIn. But maybe we start with Clinical Research Justice League because that's very unique. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it's kind of the goal. And it wasn't something that had a whole lot of forethought, to be honest. So two years ago, so the beginning of 2022, there was just this little LinkedIn post and it ended up going viral. And people started calling me Batman, clinical research Batman. They started calling you. Yeah. So you didn't yeah. call yourself that. No, no. I, I like to think I'm not that arrogant. But uh, <laughs> I um, thought that was like a thing you picked and you're like, I'm going to run with this. I, so I did. I did run with it. And I the Justice League, right? The Justice League was your idea, though. Yeah, okay. the Justice League was my idea. So gotcha. later, later 2022, um, I kept thinking, what am I going to do with this? Because you know it was it was enjoyable, uh, and I helped like it helped give me a voice. I feel like, or at least you know, a little more recognition on the platform. And it's like, well, let's let's not thwart our opportunities. And Thanksgiving 2022, I formally announced and launched the Clinical Research Justice League. Um, what was the idea behind that? Like, so why? That's such a powerful the thing Justice to say. League focuses on issues of ethics, diversity, equality, inclusion. Um, okay. The concept behind it was, you know, LinkedIn's a great platform. Everybody has their own individual voice on there, and I wanted to create a community space where you know it's not just certain members in involved. Anybody who wants to join can join. Uh, we're not going to restrict anybody from joining the group um, there are you know group policies you, Do know, you guys meet like on zoom or we haven't yet okay um, it's just it's just conversation on the on the panel back and forth between each other just on that platform on LinkedIn so it's a group on, on LinkedIn, LinkedIn. You oh you have it. like a group chat on LinkedIn we're looking to expand uh, to, okay to potentially start like an actual um, organization or like a com. movement like uh, and Latinos in clinical research yeah, so or something we can hopefully like that. share newsletters and things like that with you know more pressing issues and some of the action that we're gonna try to drive and hopefully get up polls and things like that okay um, something a little more concrete in that sense but um, there's some poetic aspect to it that I found myself as you know as given like the name Batman if you know anything about like DC superheroes Batman's the only one who doesn't have actual superpowers that's right, right that's right um, so there's other people like Wonder Woman and Superman, and you know I've reached out and connected with so many people who so many are here today. Some some couldn't make it. Okay. Um, Danielle Mitchell, with Black Women in Clinical She's Research. She's part of this. Hadi Danawi, uh, Arizona wow. Clinical Research. He's um, here. So those are the people who I see okay. personally as like superheroes to really wow. drive change and make an impact for you know e equality and. That's and awesome. That, so. so when did you? Because you have a um, pretty interesting career you've done a lot of, uh, specifically cra yeah most recently at uh, several different cro's yeah when did you realize there were issues in this industry like from that required something as powerful as a justice league was it right away like i mean i think you could I think you can realize, unless you're completely blind, you know, the way I see it, I think you can realize <laughs> there's an issue immediately. Um, but as far as what the need was or how I can, I can work and not just sit, sit quietly and do nothing about it, um, that didn't really hit me until just a certain little spark occurred. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, think, then I ran with it. I think that requires, like... 
experience. You know, like I think seeing the faults relatively quickly, you can start seeing like within six months of working any job in this industry. Yeah. But to actually come up with solutions and then to build a team or a community around that, I think that comes with experience. Uh, and some of the panels we're going to have today are about industry relationships and networking. Right. I mean, you right. could have easily been on that panel too, uh, from what I hear about you. But let's go way back to what you started as a paramedic. Yeah, well, so I first got involved in research. Uh, nepotism, probably the best way to say it. Uh, my mom was in research. She's a research nurse. She wore lots of hats in the industry, and global project management, all that. Um, yeah. So really in high school, it's like 16, when she got me involved just putting together study binders, uh, basic materials. So she got you involved work. like early on. She did. She did. And then, you know, obviously I have to be a little rebellious, carve my own path. And I was a paramedic and an instructor for many years and then got pulled back in. There was an opportunity that opened up and I took it. What was your first job when you came back? Uh, complete opposite of most. It was a contract CRA. Right off the bat. Right off the bat. So they, they identified, like you identified this company or did you know about that company? Yeah, it was through, through network connections. So wow. pe people I knew that were already in the industry. That's what it is. They had a rescue study opportunity that, that came up. Those uh, rescue studies give do. all the opportunities. Yeah. So you, they have this influx of a need and it was like, oh, you know, you currently what you're doing and then with your background, I think you'd be a good fit. So I contracted as a junior CRA. Wow. Yeah. So your first day was photos. you're on your own or someone shadowed with you? Yeah, no, I was I was shadowing, I would say, okay. on my first day. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's typical onboarding, I would say. That's good. But, That's good. Yeah. But to get contract CRA, because literally this morning I got a question from someone, hey, I'm a CRA, but I want to find more contract CRA roles. How yeah. do I do that? And I'm like, well, it's Network. typically going to be... The, the CROs you've never heard of? It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so I'm, I'm still amazing friends with this entire, uh, entire CRO. Wow. Um, I like to define them as a mom and pop CRO. They're still they're small? small? They're still boutique? Uh, I think when I was there, we'd, we had roughly 30 employees um, and then some additional contracted CRAs. But it's pretty small scale when you think of a, a CRO. You don't think of 30 people in a room. Wow. And and this person proceeded to ask me, how do I find, do you know any of these boutique CROs? I said, yeah, the whole point of this is like, they're not household names. You have to go find them. Right. I mean, the long tail is very long of sites, of CROs. Everyone knows the big ones. Ikevio is one of the sponsors here, but not everyone knows what's in the long tail. And that's right. the whole point of you got to go find it. You got to go network. The opportunities are there. You just got to go look for it. They absolutely are. And quite often they get they get pigeonholed. You know, same yeah. thing with a lot of CRAs and sites. You're awarded a certain type of trial. You know, you work a whole bunch of diabetes studies or that's what you're getting at your site. Those are the opportunities you're going to continue to get and they're going to give them to you. Right. Um, I have a separate issue with that because I don't think, you know, as really quasi medical providers in this space, you know, especially if you think of physicians. Um, There's a lot here too. Right. It, it really doesn't need to be as pigeonholed as it, as it really is. No. So. You know where it is pigeonholed is like Latin America. The, their FDA, it's uh, Cafe, Cafe Priest, I believe. I'm ruining the name. Uh, I always get it wrong. They're very strict. We're lucky here in the States. They're very strict on who can be a coordinator so their regulatory bodies look at every DOA log on every study, and they have to approve it before that site gets started, like an extra check. Like, like the IRB has to approve a site. Yeah. Their FDA has to do that. You and imagine the turnover. Imagine the turnover. Imagine like the inability to train and, and retain staff. We've got it easy here, and people are still complaining. Oh, it's really hard. I'm getting pigeonholed. And their, their doctors, like if there's a sp certain specialty, like whatever the therapeutic area, the PI must be that specialist. So it's not like 
Okay. The ones here where like internal medicine can basically do everything. You just got to yeah. justify getting the patients. Yeah, you get, or you have a sub I that's a board yeah. certified. Yeah, exactly. they won't allow that there in, in uh, Latin America, specifically Mexico. They won't allow that. I just learned that last week. So we've got a lot going for ourselves here in the States. And it's just a matter of networking, just like you did. I mean, you found that job, your first job in research after being a paramedic contract CRA. Yeah. And so what happened after that? Me. Like you went, you went on to one of the bigger CROs. I did. I did. Um, so COVID was really when that change happened. So that's when that happened for yep. you. I mean, that okay. shook the entire industry, changed everything up. Yeah. Um, We're still benefiting from the surplus of work that that created. Absolutely. I mean, there were so many benefits that I know we're going to talk about a lot at the yeah. conference today, yeah. too. But um, the, we've also seen a backpedal, you know, to reverting back to the before times. Um, Hopefully not. Yeah, I think I'm with. You. Are you seeing that? I'm with like you. a slowdown. Are you seeing a slowdown? It's right a slowdown, but in the sense of um, uh, operations and the direction that we want to take things with remote okay. functionalities, central monitoring, things like that. But there's there are kind of almost like separate parties where it's you know, yeah. one side is very pro, continue to make progress. Yeah. Others want to, okay, you know, we're past COVID. Let's revert back to the things that were tried and true before. Ah. Instead of expanding. I see where you're going. There's a paper versus e-source panel. Yeah. You're absolutely. not on that one, right? I'm not on no, that no, panel. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I actually want to see that one. Um, so... You started with the bigger CRO. Yep. You went to a with bunch some, of sites. With like some bigger CROs. Um, you know, I was recently a lead CRA with one of them. Um, and then had lead. an opportunity. So you're in charge of mentoring other CRAs and all that? Right, right. Wow. Trip report review, you know, running weekly CRA meetings. And what do you like, like better, lead trainings. CRA or regular CRA? Uh, well, I think it just depends on the time you're at in your career, right? Yeah. So I'm not, I, I absolutely love it now, um, that concept now. I mean, currently I'm a director at the company called Wide Trial, mm -hmm. and we focus on expanded access care. Totally different realm, same umbrella of yeah. research, but a yeah. uh, very different niche. Um, but I, I, I'm at the point in my, my career, you know, I've been a CRA for greater than eight years now in the industry for a while, okay. that I just needed to continue going. And it's nothing against Leveling up who, too. Yeah, was it easy for you to do that? Lifers as CRAs. I know a lot of CRAs that have been around the same time, eight years, and they're like, yep. yeah, how do I become a lead CRA? Like, is it that unclear how to do it? S speak up. <laughs> you, you <ha> <laughs> Did you speak up? That's part of it. This is one of the things I'm talking about later today is you have to have a voice, and that really is going to help propel you to where you want to go. Uh, mm -hmm. I was never one, you know, probably to, some people liked it and some people might not have, but I was never one to... Uh, to hold back, I always had questions, always finding issues and bringing them to the forefront um, with systems and whatever it is that we're working on. And okay, it's those kinds of things that. So you had to speak up for yourself in Absolutely. order to get that lead CRA. Did you have to leave companies to do it, or did you were you able to stay at the same? I, I did not. Okay. Um, okay. It, there was an opportunity. So a good friend of mine, she was she was a lead CRA uh, where I was at, and. She was going out on maternity leave. Oh, so it, okay. it initially started as a, a temporary position. And then they were like, you know, at a certain point it was like, hey, you're crushing it. You know, let's just make this permanent. Uh, yeah. So. And so in that role, you're reviewing the trip reports. Yeah. You're sending revisions really, back. Really everything. So I mean, trip reports uh -huh. is a small facet. I even had another trip report reviewer. Um, then you have to go in behind that and make sure that you're aware of any issues and you're trying to find systemic issues throughout the study, um, throughout specific sites. So we're staying prevalent. What about, do you, as a lead CRA, do you deal with problem sites? Problem sites, problem So they CRAs. give you the problems, basically, um, yeah, as the lead. Yeah, you get the problems, but you also get ov your overall the study. I mean, a lot of people mm -hmm. think almost, almost like a CTM in yeah, that sense. Yeah, you know, I was, yeah. most of my days started out running uh, massive Excel spreadsheets for EDC, looking at IP and, and making sure I'm tracking everything. And I knew where our numbers were 
throughout the okay. entire time. And ha like if, if a CRA, yeah, you know, I see it, see an increase of surgeries coming up, for example, it's like maybe we need to get on site a couple more days to, to ensure we we're able to look at everything. Okay. What from just if you can give like a little bit of advice for the sites watching, how do you not become a problem site? And like, is the border between not a problem site and a problem site very easy to cross? I, th I think so. I'm, I don't think anybody gets involved in this industry to begin with without some degree of passion. I do see that that can be lost along the way. Yes. Uh, burnout's a real thing <laughs> in, in every, every job, Losing every the industry. passion to that, yeah. So it's, it's rough, it's rough. Um, but I think, I think that might be it, you know, making sure you're doing everything you can to stay positive and, and look at why you're still doing it, and that's gonna help keep that positive attitude. Um, but you know, it, as a CRA too, it's, it's rough. Um, you know, as a, a I've seen some, a lot of people. I spent some time as a, as a site owner as well, uh, SMO, mm -hmm. startup kind of thing we were working on, trying to provide an ease of access for physicians who wanted to get into research that weren't. Um, we're no longer doing that or exploring that avenue, um, but you know, I've, I've seen a lot of those different perspectives, and I know those relationships can be strained with CRAs and sites. Yes. I don't like saying there's just problem sites. Maybe maybe there could be um, no, but there issues, are. But as a site advocate, there are problem sites, and I think they're not labeled. Like I think a good site can be a problem site on a certain study and be a great site on another study at the same time. I think it's possible. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that it's also somewhat vague of a term too. A problem exactly. Site. Like what kind exactly. of a problem? Are you not enrolling enough, or is the PI ab absent? <laughs> Right. There's different levels of extremes there, for sure. Or are you just not focused on this study, Yeah. but you're focused on the other trial, you know? But, you know, as a site advocate as well, that takes it back to, are you not focused on this trial because there's significant issues that are making this trial so much more challenging? And it's usually it's a to oopsie. Focus your time on the other. I think as a site owner, it's usually when I get in my, when I find myself in those situations, it's oops. We shouldn't have ever taken this study. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it comes back to feasibility in a way. Right. Uh, which, whose fault is that? I mean, I guess ultimately it's the site owner, the person who chose that study. But you could also blame the CRA for not doing a more thorough job at SSV. You could blame the PI for not sure. speaking up. I mean, yeah. I think it's shared responsibilities for Absolutely. this thing. It is multifaceted, 100%. So yeah. with that sense of a problem site, I mean, there's there's more than just one player. Yeah, and yeah. Typically, because I know my site, I don't think right now we're a problem site on any study, thank God. But like a year ago, we were. We were a problem site on one study and like the best site on another at the same time, same coordinator, same PI, everything, same. Nice. Because we figured out, hey, why did we pick this study? It's yeah. not worth trying to screen everyone's screen failing. Let's right. just kind of put less effort into it. I mean, it's the ugly truth of this industry is like that's kind of how it works. Right. And I don't, I, from my perspective, I don't see that as a problem. Like, there's, there's an <laughs> that aspect. That sponsor did that. As, yeah, as a lead CRA, though, it's more focused on the monitoring. You know, we're, my main goal is always, you know, make sure we're doing right by the patients. Um, For, of course. Right, good clinical practice comes of first. Of course. So if you're going to put a patient in a study, take care of them. Right. Follow GCP at minimum. Right. Make them have a good experience, of course. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, sponsors across the world are going to hate me, but my focus is not how many patients you're getting on the trial. Gotcha. That's um, probably one of the least, least enjoyable parts of my job was, you know, talking about recruiting and, and those strategies. But at the same time, I do, I do want to help sites. There's, there's definitely a vested interest in wanting to support our sites to do better with, with enrollment as well. And the bottom line, I think, for sponsors is, you know, this is data. And it's it used to be a million dollars a day that they're spending on a typical trial. That was pre-COVID. It's got to be way more now. It might be $2 million. I wouldn't be surprised with inflation and everything that's changed that it's not $2 million a day. So, yeah, treat the patients well, but recruit like they're really focused on those top oh, yeah. line numbers oh absolutely 
Yeah. This this is a really good conversation. I do think we need to do more because we've only like glanced at uh, side glanced at the Justice League. I think that needs its own thing. <laughs> Ab- absolutely. You know, I would, I would love to get a, a potentially a larger panel. I mean, that's kind of the concept of the Justice League too is give more people a voice. So yeah, it would be awesome to sit down with you know three or four four individuals and have a collaborative conversation with you. Can you take us out with your famous Batman voice, please, for the camera? What do you want me to say? Like, subscribe, comment, share. If you're not at this SOS conference, you need to come to the next year. As Batman, that would be awesome, man. (laughs) Well, just do the like and subscribe. Yes. It's it's been talking so much lately. The voice is rather raw. That's fine. That's fine. All right, here we go. Like and subscribe. (laughs) Batman, everybody. (laughs) Mitchell Hill be... His LinkedIn is underneath this video and in the show notes if you're listening. you got to go connect with him. Uh, Like he said, anyone can join the Clunker Research Justice League. But before you ask to join, make sure you understand what it's about. Make sure you get to know him. That's part of networking, too. You obviously do a really good job at it. Thank you so much, Mitch, for coming out and supporting us. Really nice to meet you first time yesterday, but I've, I've known about you for like a year. Yeah. So keep up the good work. I've been watching from afar. and Thank you. The other SOS founders say really good things about you. So I trust what they say. And from the few interactions we've had, man, I, I yeah. agree. I feel like we're all family already. So it's great. It's a big family. It's getting bigger. Yep. But thank you so much. Everybody go connect. Mitchell, like, subscribe, comment, share. Bye-bye. Hey, if you guys like that kind of content, make sure you like, subscribe, comment, share. Stay tuned for more videos.